Hello, ladies and gentlemen of YouTube. I am Clementine, and as always, I am Super Saiyan. But never mind that. In this video, we're going to talk about how a small Japanese bookshelf speaker from the 1970s became one of the most widely used studio monitors of all time. We'll talk a little bit about the strange history and myths that surround the subject of these particular speakers, including articles about the specific sound properties of certain brands of toilet paper. Yes, they made spectral graphs of the sound of butt wipe tissue. I'll show you how you can acquire a set of them uh, without having to sell your testicle, repair and or mod those so that they're damn near bulletproof, and we'll put them onto 700 watts, crank it up, work the hell out of them, and I will share my own thoughts and experience and what my own theories are on why the speaker that supposedly sounds so horrible is somehow the key to recording hit songs. Violin J, Dr. Dre, CLA. It's the Yamaha NS10. If this sounds like something you might be interested in, stay tuned! Roll that beautiful bean footage. Once again, I want to quickly blame this on the YouTube algorithm. I'm watching these music documentaries. I start seeing these little white cones popping up in the back. At first, it ain't so bad. Then next thing I know, it just starts getting a little too much of a coincidence. Then next thing you know, it's starting to get kind of demanding feeling. Then you look around and you're in an NS10 echo chamber. It is truly amazing though how prevalent Yamaha NS10s are in like music documentaries, interviews, and uh, tutorials. <laughs> now my interest is peaked to the max, so I watch a couple videos about them. I'm like, let's see about buying some of these. Oh. Technically, they say you only need one, but I might get in an accident. <laughs> Other words, this ain't happening. So I start Googling and reading articles and trying to figure out what is the special thing about this speaker. This is a fine example of exactly what you'll see over and over again. Unlocking the mystery of the greatest loudspeaker in history. See, it's just praise, 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 and we don't know why it's so good. They used it on all the hits because they sound horrible. Okay, I gotta check some forums and see why the actual professionals all love these speakers then. I didn't like them much when you could buy them new back in the day, and I like them even less now that they are old, outdated and surpassed by other modern monitors. I hate them. What? For less mean and working K, how many albums have been made with them or how many big time so and so's used them with success? I cannot stand them. Hurried. Bro, what are you talking about, man? It isn't about what a monitor sounds like. It's about what it makes you do. Remove 2K from everything that needs it. Add too much top and bottom. Rip all my hair out in disgust. I'll take horror tones over NS10s every time. Okay then, I guess not everybody loves these speakers. And then it got interesting. This is utter hogwashing. Expletive deleted. Do you know why all you haters hate the NS10s? Because you're not good enough to get a good mix out of them. Almost every working studio in LA has them because it's hard to get a mix to sound good on them. Once you do, you have a good mix. That's the fundamental problem with haters. They hate because they don't understand. Okay, here's the dilemma. We just listened to all that crap. Now what do we learn? Nothing. It was exact same as that article except people are fighting everywhere now. People hate them because they sound terrible and then other people say you gotta have them because they sound terrible. We're sorry. Your number cannot be completed as that. Please hang up and try again. I'm gonna be honest with you, man. This kind of thing bothers me. This is what makes me go super sane. Um, I'm, I'm gonna want you blueprints, patent information, dimensions, diagrams, schematics, Wikipedia, owner's manuals, PDFs, scientific papers, 80s mix magazines, ancient looking websites with incredible information. And I'm too lazy to write anything down or write a script, so this is all just stored up in the noggin. I think the easiest way to relay it to you is just in chronological order. And yes, Bob Clear Mountain, guy who is about to fucking you blow a gasket, Bob Clear Mountain, yeah. That might have been a calculated move and I kept you here this long. <laughs> okay, so it's the 70s. Not those 70s, these 70s in Japan. There's a young engineer by the name of Akira Nakamura, and he's working for Yamaha, building loudspeakers for like the home audiophile market. His NS1000M, large format three-way speaker, has blown everyone's mind in the company with the design and it's just selling. So they all decide to have Mr. Nakamura design a small like bookshelf style apartment size version. So he works designing through 1977 this two-way speaker system, small 7 inch paper cone subwoofer 
sealed packed enclosure, a robust high quality crossover with large capacitors, and a set of tweeters that would uh, send your eyelashes off. And in 1978, Yamaha released the first model, the NS10M. It's basically just a stout little bookshelf speaker. Well, they look little in pictures anyway. That enclosure is actually 10.4 liters. They're almost 16 inches tall and weigh over 13 pounds as well. Nominal input power of only 25 watts and a max power of 50 watts. And that's basically all she wrote. It seemed like this speaker was just destined to fade away into history. In fact, the NS stands for natural sound. And being a great engineer, <laughs> Mr. Nakamura made these uh, small speakers where whatever sound you put into them is exactly what came out. And the legend goes that people thought they sounded horrible and that they didn't sell very well at all. But Akira Nakamura himself said in an interview that they sold just fine. And this is speculation on my part, but I think that when some of those Japanese people heard these speakers, and they're probably the ones who make music, and they were looking for a substitute to the aura tone or horror tones, as people call them, American small little speaker that are made to make play music, and people used them to reference the mix on smaller speakers so they make sure that if it knocks on those, it'll knock on something bigger. Quincy Jones referenced a mix thriller on aura tones. And this is where we get back to Oh, they make stuff sound good because they sound bad and yawn. The myth is repeated. Once again. And now the story's supposed to jump to the 80s to Bob Clear Mountain. And his magic hit making speakers covered in toilet paper. But I personally think there's a little bit more to it than that. Because I looked through all those mix magazines from the 80s. I'm talking about like four years worth of issues. Every page. There were very, very few pictures of NS10s before like 1984 late in the year. And I'm talking about like maybe one or two. Everybody was using Oratones. And we gotta think about this, man. From the late 70s to like the mid 80s, Japan was the shit. All the rock stars are going to Japan. It's the place to be. They got the synthesizers, giant arcades, motorcycles, cars, and back to the future. All Marty wanted was that damn Toyota truck. All the best stuff is made in Japan. So either way, here in America, there's a couple guys working at this studio called The Station in New York that's a, a converted from an old Edison power station. Some of the guys working here just happen to be Bob Clear Mountain and Chris Lord Algae. They're doing creative, amazing mixes here, stuff like putting a speaker in the bottom of the stairwell and put mics way at the top, piping Bruce Springsteen through it so it goes, everybody's got a hungry heart. If you're watching this, you make music and you know how people that make music are, so they come snooping around, the magazines, the other artists, uh, the producers, and they look behind Bob and Chris, and there's these black boxes of white speakers in them. But I've never heard anybody say, how'd they get there? How did Bob figure them out? Uh, d I've heard that he had a set at home and he was listening to them, and then he brought them to work. Mmm, that's a little... Nigel Jobson, I believe, was in England at this time, using them as well. And that's halfway in between them and Japan. You'll also see people say, Rhett Davies, Bill Shineman, uh, Andy Wallace. Anyway, boom, it was done. Everybody had to have them. And apparently this was also around the time that somebody saw Bob Clear Mountain using toilet paper or tissue paper. I believe he said he preferred one ply of Kleenex or something specific like that. But either way, it <laughs> caused everybody to start putting toilet paper over their tweeters. And Bob Hodas, I believe it was, wrote an entire scientific paper and did actual tests in a lab to see about this toilet paper phenomenon. From what I remember, I think he just figured out that it caused horrible comb filtering and it wasn't the ideal thing to do. I think the story goes something like uh, of Bob Clearmountain saying that this speaker's cooking my ear, man. Uh, we got to put a resistor on the tweeter and get that thing softened up a little bit. And they said, no, no, man, that'll mess up the crossover. We're not putting no resistance in there. And then he was like, okay. And he taped some paper over the tweeter. I've heard though that if you just take that cover that nobody has and you snap it back over the speaker that it will work exactly as Mr. Nakamura designed it to and all that piercing highs will come down to a perfect level. Imagine that. Engineers. It don't look as cool though. So of course uh, Yamaha gets a uh, word on all this toilet paper mess and they're like damn dude this is making us look bad. And also everybody's ripping the covers off of them putting them sideways anyway. There's been studies done on that upright versus sideways. They've also gained a bad reputation for just blowing, popping, catching on fire because people would put way too much square wave information into them while tracking something like a synthesizer and just blow them out. So Mr. Nakamura does a bit of a redesign and in 1987 they release the NS10M Studio. 
Now this is the one everyone wants. It's made to sit on its side. It doesn't even have a cover. The tweeter has been redesigned with a felt ring inside to dampen and smooth the high-end response as the cover would have done. The crossover had also been redesigned with the new stronger terminals and a circuit inside with a beefier value component that would allow a maximum input wattage of 120 watts, as well as extending the lower base range down to a 60 hertz where the original was only 85. And now that you've watched this video, the YouTube algorithm is going to show you NS10M Studios over and over and over again. I know very few of you personally, but I'm just guessing that these are way too expensive for peasants like us. So let's talk about what kind of options you got to do something about that. Okay, so first thing I immediately thought, let's do the hipster thing. Let's look at the prices of the less desirable but vintage model. Well, hell, nope, that ain't gonna work neither. My first inclination is to figure out how to DIY this. I looked at examples, tried to learn everything that I could, and that's really the reason why I learned all the information in the beginning of this video. I thought this is just a bunch of wooden wire. It can absolutely be replicated. But alas, I found that with the unavailability of specific parts, the price of materials could easily exceed the value of an actual set of Yamaha NS10s. But while trying to find parts, I got a clue as to why they were so expensive. There's another myth, we'll call it, that Yamaha had to quit making these speakers in like 1992 or so because the white paper cones were made out of some kind of special, highly endangered unicorn paper trees, which sounds like a story somebody's drunk uncle came up with, but Akira Nakamura himself agreed with this in an interview and basically said this super pure unicorn magic paper is a good bit of what makes the special sound of the speaker. So fantastic, I won't be DIYing any. Now, you could quite easily and cheaply make a very very close speaker to a Yamaha NS10 but it wouldn't be a Yamaha NS10 not exactly unless you had SPL and frequency testing equipment which would uh, also cost a lot of money <laughs> not to mention a lot of time and effort during the time I was looking for these parts however I realized that one of the guys back from the power station Chris Lord Algae was carrying the torch for the NS10s. He had worked with the Vantone to create the CLA10, which is exactly a 100% copy of the Yamaha NS10 Studio. And they're actually not super expensive for a 100% copy of the desirable studio model that's brand new and guaranteed to work with a warranty. Unfortunately, this is still way too much money for me. And I want to point out this one word here, passive. This means you need an amp to power these speakers. And once again, with the rumors and the myths and the people being mad at each other in forums, there's an entire rabbit hole about what amplifier you should use with NS10s, and we're not really going to go down it in this video. They make both active version with an amp inside and a CLA amp to go with the passive speakers, but they both cost about the same and definitely way too much for me. But it's okay, guys. We're going to get us some of these speakers because we're armed with knowledge. Here's the 300 IQ super fucking hipster deluxe idea. When these speakers first came out in Japan, they were nothing special. They were just a grandpa speakers he would use to listen to the morning talk radio. Speakers like that end up at thrift stores. eBay sellers often flip items from thrift stores. I should check eBay Japan. I found prices were much more manageable depending on shipping. I also deducted that some of these sellers specialize in finding, repairing, and flipping in S10. If you don't mind some uh, wear and tear or yellow cones, you can get really good deals. You could haunt these listings until you find individual parts like this that actually are very inexpensive. Build an entire set of NS10s for like $30, $40 here and there. And for the guy who found a listing like this and thought, hell yeah, near the beginning of this video when I showed how much those speakers were, you just keep sitting there smugly watching this video like you got it all figured out. Well, see, this is not a scam per se, but it's not an NS10. This is an NS10. M M. It's the mini version. These are like Barbie size. So she probably canceled that order. And the rest of y'all watch out for this because when they got covers on them, they look almost identical to regular NS10s with covers on them. Speaking of NS10s with covers on them, this is one particular box that I received in the post all the way from Japan. It contains one near mint condition set of 1978 Yamaha NS10Ms. Condition was actually pretty astounding. Uh, these are old man specials for sure. Besides from a little discoloration in the cone and scuffs here and there, uh, they look pretty much brand new. I did find one thing in particular concerning, however. Both the cones were 
tight. No, they, they were hard as concrete. I quickly shift that to the back of my mind, set them up in the box, get some good glamour shots with that Japanese print paper all around. Take them to the studio, move my other passive monitors out of the way, hook them up for a quick test, and it sounds like an elevator. <laughs> I immediately knew something was severely wrong with these. But I also knew not to ask for them because everybody's just going to say, Oh, that's what they sound like. They're awful. They're terrible. So I took one of them apart. Everything on the inside looked fine. So I unhooked the subwoofer and took the box and sub separately, hooked them up. When I hooked the sub up by itself, it's putting out nothing but high frequency. So I turned the amp up, see if I could kind of break it loose. Nah, there's something totally wrong. It was horribly loud and uh, high pitched. I hook a test speaker up to the crossover inside the cabinet to test it, and it's beating so hard it about coming out of my hand, so there's nothing wrong with the crossover. Yeah, that thing's rocking. It was right when I opened up the second speaker box that I knew exactly what was wrong. I noticed the magnet was funny looking. I pulled on it just a little bit and it come right off. Well, not right off. It was very hard to pull it off because of magnetism, but obviously uh, during some point in this thing's life, maybe even shipping, it could have shipped perfectly, but the magnets have come unglued and come out of line and this one's completely loose. But now the subwoofer is loose and I see yeah, they're not supposed to be tight like that. If you have a trebly ass set of NS10s with uh, tight speakers, yeah, your, your magnets have probably shifted and they're binding up your voice cords. So my special unicorn paper speakers is smoked. Back to the power station, back to Chris Lord Algae. Hey, he makes replacement speakers. They are kind of expensive, but luckily that Japanese eBay seller, he's put the cost of repair with me. Okay, so now that I really can't afford to ever replace these speakers again, and the power amp in my studio is a good healthy 700 watts, I'm gonna do a mod to bulletproof these speakers. That sounds like a great thing. Why wouldn't everybody do it? No, no, NS10s. There's a whole rabbit hole of that mod. Everybody hates it. Go figure. So here's the mod. Uh, you take a fuse holder and you put it in line to the speaker and the tweeter, one for each. And you put like a one amp fuse in one and three quarter amp fuse for the tweeter because it's smaller. You don't want it to get enough power. To ever be able to pop without popping the fuse first. That's the idea. But people say, oh, it takes some definition out of the speaker and it colors the sound. Well, also, I have the model with the tweeter that everybody says sounds awful, so they started taping toilet paper over it. So if I put a fuse in line with the tweeter and it kind of acts like a resistor, then aren't I doing exactly what Bob Clear Mountain asked the engineer to do, which he refused, which is why he had to use toilet paper. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Either way, the bulletproofing was done, the fuses were installed, and with these new speakers, it looks awesome. Right out the gate on the first test, I turned that uh, 700 watt amp three quarter of the way up. As you could plainly hear, even through a cell phone camera, properly operating NS10s with plenty of headroom and horsepower behind them do not sound like grocery store speakers. So I made it a point over the next two or three weeks to listen to every one of my favorite albums to these speakers. All the hit songs that I could think of. Also tracked, mixed, and recorded music on these speakers. I wanted to get a good, solid idea about NS10s, how they work, and what my own thoughts on them are. First thing is, no, they do not sound like grocery store speakers or elevator speakers. No, they don't boom like ported boxes. You don't really get a lot of sub bass out of them, although you can still hear it quietly. You can tell if a song's got an 808 on it. You can hear what the tune of the 808 is. But what it does do is kind of a bass snap. The low mids are extremely percussive with these speakers. It is, it's that take your breath percussion that you feel in your face and chest. So what about them tweeters? What about the stabbing highs? Do they sound terrible? No, not really. These speakers sound pretty pleasant, pretty uh, clear, clean. I know that I must do what's right. As a comparison, a set of Bear Dynamic DT990 headphones have a whole lot more high end than these speakers. To me, what you really hear a lot of is mid bass like a lower mids and then high mids. If I just freehand drew a frequency chart of these speakers from my own experience, and I, I mean, I don't have audiophile hearing, it would probably look like an M, like the McDonald's arches. 
So, with all the hype, do I think they're special? Have they worked for me? I almost hate to say it because it seems like confirmation bias, but yes, absolutely yes. There is something going on with those low mids, that percussive low mid. You can have these speakers so loud that it feels like they're slapping you in the face while you're in front of them, and then leave the room and go to another room, and it sounds like they're barely on. It's like that scene in Ace Ventura where he kept opening and shutting the sliding glass door going, ah. And even though that tweeter is super clear, and I mean mega clear, I think that the magic in the speaker is that low mid punch. You can look at a decay time graph for a lot of different monitors and see that what the NS10 and the Auratone have in common is that very, very short bass response. And those two speakers just tend to show up wherever money's being made. Now this is obviously good for mixing to have this uh, speaker that's very non-hyped in the low end and very truthful. The place I personally found it the most useful for was for like selecting kick drum and snare sounds when tracking. You can just flip through two or three kick sounds and know immediately what's working and what might kick really great on a set of subs, but you cannot hear it through these NS10s and you won't hear it through a phone either. These speakers have also allowed me to hear compression like never before. You can hear when it starts to compress to be perfect and then to over compress like day and night and when i used to have my subwoofer running most of the low end and all the high frequency coming out of little satellite speakers it, the boom would just be a boom you couldn't really tell what the compression was doing to it in fact if you listen to 20 songs you could probably write down what you think was mixed on these and what wasn't because some of them is going to be killing on it snapping popping you like a michael jackson teddy riley kind of stuff dr dre but then there's other stuff like more indie music. You just can't even hardly tell what's going on on these speakers. Kind of sounds like a lot of high pitched noise. <laughs> so overall, am I happy with them? Am I happy with the way things turned out? Well, it kind of sucked that I had to fix broken speakers and all that. But even though I can't really mix very good at all because I can't hear great. So these speakers are probably not going to turn me into the next Chris Lord Algae or Bob Clear Mountain mixing master. I kind of feel like I don't have to because they're like the instrument sound selection cheat code of history when you automatically know like which bass to pick which kick to pick what needs compression what's booming too much what ain't thin the resulting song is a breeze to mix in comparison of something done otherwise <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna be using these from now on and i do understand why they're everywhere now i need to know about them uh Oratones. Till next time!